the first time she comes back and kind of sees her son, you know, the first thing she says is like, oh, you're going to America. Like it's uh, some thing I should be happy about. And again, I was old enough to really kind of understand what's going on, but young enough to really not get the meaning of it, what that really meant and what that was going to look like. Jacob, welcome to the Crave Struggle Podcast. I'm super excited to have you on, man. Hot oh, man, thank you, Luke. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's been long overdue, so I'm very excited. Yeah, man. So you came to the States when you were nine years old. Tell me a little bit about that. Kind of give some back history and what happened during those first nine years. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, yeah, like you said, I was nine. I think it was eight, eight and a half when I got first adopted um and it was a again it was a crazy experience because i remember everything to be honest and um it was a good bad roller coaster that even with the process of getting adopted and even just living in ethiopia i got i was brought here with my little brother uh reggie and it was uh it was cool experience because he lived seven hours away but my experience i lived in the countryside so um it was called waliso and i don't know exactly how much the population was but my mom was never in my life um never knew my dad um my mom was one of those who chased you know men for stability you know she needed that reinsurance from guys to tell her that you know it was it was bad she dropped me off of my grandma my grandma rose like raised me up uh she uh there's a picture if you ever search ethiopian women the common picture that comes up is women holding this large stick right and that's how they provide income the, the male doesn't even provide income so i was uh my uncle was very abusive uh to me uh, and until I was put in the orphanage, that was really the cycle of life that I was, you know, into. My grandma really was really old, like late 60s, early 70s, um, taking care of me and my cousins. I was the only child my mom had, supposedly. I, I don't know, you know, who knows if there's other siblings or not, but, um, and my one day i remember actually we went to this school but you know education not really taken seriously in ethiopia or really in third world countries but especially in ethiopia where i'm from as grown men in my class and i was eight eight i don't know why i went in the orphanage so i was probably six six or seven right and there was grown men and I would come home. I remember this vivid, vividly that the day my mom told me she was giving me up for adoption. I didn't even know what it meant. I had this green uniform on, right, that they gave us that probably been worn by, you know, 10,000 kids before me that just give shirts that with holes everywhere. And I walked in. My mom, you know, surprisingly out of the blue, you know, she was where my grandma was in Waliso. And she said, yeah, you know, I you're going to America, you know? Again, like I told you earlier, we were talking about before we started recording, it was like how Ethiopia, uh, America was seen as the platform of, you know, a place to be, especially for us who never seen white people, who never seen cars. We do see cars, rarely, never been in one. And when we see Ferenges, which we call them, like I said, we would run by them asking for caramela 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 you know that's how my childhood was growing up and when that day when my mom told me i really didn't understand it i understand what i was getting into didn't understand what that really meant um and it was a few months later where there was an orphanage i didn't know of it was it was about an hour walk from where i lived yeah about an hour walk and this orphanage leader he uh we went and got signed up. We met him at his little office, his sketchy office. He had this little putt putt car that, you know, <laughs> we would like clean all the time when we were in the orphanage. So 
I started there, um, went to the orphanage. I can't exactly remember the date because we have different years in Ethiopia. Uh, the calendar, like, it's really weird. I, I Wait, can't what really is it like? It. So you guys, you guys don't have three. Yeah, what is the calendar year in Ethiopia? What, what do you guys do? Is read about it and like it's what what what's the name that my dad used? It's uh it's an old calendar that we use. Um, what is it called? Not the Aztec. I don't think it's the Aztec calendar. <laughs> that would be pretty old. But it's something. It's like one of the first ones calendar that we started using. I don't know what it's called. I can't really think of the name, but. So our years, I don't know if it's, we're ahead or behind, but it's it's something weird. But I can't remember exactly the date that I went into the orphanage, right? And then when we did, uh, that day I went into the orphanage, it was like the reality really set in that like, this is for real. Uh, this is something that my mom actually gave me up. And I think that's when the mental aspect that things really started because in ethiopia we don't eat like i can, I, I don't really would want to put like a stamp on like saying just ethiopians but like people from where i'm where i'm from we don't feel physical pain and my parents here can testify to that and for the longest time that, that i was here we don't you can beat us you can hit me you can do anything we don't feel no physical pain mm -hmm. right Mentally, though, like that's also another thing we don't ever really have to think about because mostly it was physical pain. There, there's no really somebody trying to get in your head or play games. There's none of that. But when I went to the orphanage was when I first really realized that, wow, like my mom really did give me up. You know, it was like I really, really might be going to America. It was negative and positive but mostly since i was there i was kind of happy to be honest because my mom was never in my life you know the one person i counted on you know who to be there for me was never really in my life which you know kind of hurt because the first time she comes back and kind of sees her son you know the first thing she says is like oh you're going to america like it's uh some thing i should be happy about and again i was old enough to really kind of understand what's going on but young enough to really not get the meaning of it, what that really meant and what that was gonna look like. And when I went to the orphanage, that's when my battles really started. Battle against mentally and the orphanage guy. You wanna talk about human being that cares about money and harming kids. And I know that's harsh to say because it's an orphanage, but you remember I told you about the putt putt car he had? Um, he would literally every time he would come, it was like a sense of fear just comes all over the kids in the orphanage, right? It, it was like you better have clean underwear, you better have your beds made, you better have better be in the best attitude. And the dude never let me go to school. The two and a half, three years that I was in the orphanage never let me go to school. He said we don't know when you're getting adopted. I see all my friends dressed in their uniform going to school every morning and i'm just sitting by you know the little room that we had which full of bunk beds and just playing soccer or just like it was literally gated prison to be honest i know it's weird to say that but we never really got to leave the orphanage there'd be the local kids around that who would come around sometimes we play soccer with we'll sneak out and the directors there usually are like kids that grew up going to the orphanage but ended up getting a job to be uh, like a worker there so they kind of understood what it felt like so they would let us once in a while when they know the boss is not coming or you know we have this free time they'll let us go outside and play soccer right we two soccer uh, look two rocks we make our own soccer ball because again all the gifts that we got this guy orphanage director he hit it right he hit it in his little office he had little office i can vividly remember like there's like a little hill going down and there's a office gated locked like three locks on there and then there was a church like a chapel right next to it 
and everything that we get when we got like Americans to come visit, they bring us candy, shoes, you know, people that do ministry or like they are thinking about adopting a kid from there, which usually was an infant, which was another thing we can, you know, discuss, but they, he would take it, he would say, I will distribute it. I'll distribute it equally to them, to the kids, and that way it's fair. Whatever he used to say to them to get all the product, all the clothes, the candy, the shoes, he would hide it. And later on, we found out that he was selling it on the black market. And it was sad. And I didn't know about that until I got adopted and I came here. Um, and the orphanage was closed. But... Yeah, and like he would line us up when he come there. We would clean his car. He would line us up and he will have one of the workers, the male workers, check our literally pull our pants out and check if our underwear is clean, if even wearing one. And we would take shower outside in the cold, in the freezing cold water, you know? And that was kind of like my life in the orphanage pretty much every day. You get one bread for breakfast lunch it wasn't until later on maybe six hours and then dinner also followed by um like another four hour I, I can't that hour difference but like breakfast you never got pretty much anything and it was early so if you don't wake up to get breakfast you don't get any you know it's gone because the kids go to school i don't so there'll be times where if i don't wake up on time i won't eat breakfast you know mm -hmm. so but that is what my orphanage life looked like and the orphanage is closed now unfortunately like because of him he's in prison they found out that he's been selling the clothes and all this stuff on black market and i went back to visit it not like, a few years ago and there's grass growing to like over my head and all the kids are out in the street and there's one kid that i keep in contact with his name is getu and he's in nashville tennessee if he's still there i'm not sure but we do follow each other, but he's the only person I keep in contact with. Um, but yeah, that is what, you know, the kind of the process looked like of me uh, getting adopted um, or even starting the process going into the orphanage. But yeah, it's it wasn't pleasant. I'm sure, I mean, there's so many things that we could talk about it that wasn't good, but I really like don't really want to focus on that because... I am blessed beyond measures, and so you can't focus on that. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's that's awful, dude. Like, that's, that's yeah. I think that's something that <clears throat> a lot of Americans don't really know. Like, we're, yeah, we see a lot of things on social media, and we're like, oh, that's terrible, and we can, like, move on. But, like, we really have no idea. And when we talk about persecution, we're like, oh, man, like, being a Christian, like, like oh, man, I'm being persecuted right now. I'm always like, I, I would be careful about saying you're being persecuted. I get it. There, per, there's absolutely persecution in America, but I'm like, for being a Christian or not even being a Christian, there's so much persecution going on in that area. Man, that's, that's, that's tough. What, what was it then? How long were you at that orphanage? What, like you said a couple of years, but did it span on longer than that? Um, so like, I really didn't think I was going to get adopted because even the orphanage guy, the direct or the director or the super or whatever the guy title was, he really instilled in me that the fact that I might not get adopted at all. I might have to be there until eighteen and then just move out, which most kids did because people wanted to adopt infants, right? The little babies. I was eight, right? When officially kind of. My parents saw me, picture of me, and like wanted to adopt me, but I, I really didn't think I was going to get adopted at all. But my parents, my mom, my mom here is so crazy because she uh, first selected Reggie, right? So they had three girls, and they, why, they always was in their heart to adopt, and they, and they knew they wanted a little boy, right? They They knew. And Reggie was the first kid they saw and fell in love with. And my mom said she was scrolling through this, the site, whatever site, I forgot the name of it, 
Ordinary Hero. That's what it's called, I think. If I'm not mistaken, it's been a long time. But on that site, they post kids that are looking to get adopted or some sponsorship. So my mom kept scrolling after she made the decision to uh, get Reggie. She said, my smile, it was my eyes or my smile caught her eyes and she would keep going back to my picture. Mm. I was, I remember what I was wearing. His hot red pants when Kelly Putty took my picture. That was the girl, the lady's name who took my picture at the orphanage. And I had like, I could, I could share it with you, but it, it was, it was one of those pictures that just, it just happened out of the blue. And she said, how my eyes or my smile, I don't know what it was, but she kept going back to it. And she told my dad that. I really want to adopt this kid or I really want to think about adopting this kid. And dad said, you know, let's pray. Let's pray about it. Let's, you know, let God kind of lead the way, um, which is unique. And like, I haven't really kind of talked to him what that looked like. And I think I should, you know, what because that seems like the Holy Spirit, you know, and like God actually speaking to him. And obviously we're going to adopt Reggie and happen to adopt a nutcase named Mula Geta, you know, so, so she just, uh, we uh, did that, and then, like, uh, they, uh, decided to adopt me, and that's when the process really getting started, and, um, uh, and when I knew I was gonna come to America, you know, like, that thing my mom said, that you're going to America, you know, the best, like, the something that she put like a high praise on like the why she was giving me up was actually happening and that's when it was like reality set in it's like wow you know like i'm going to new york city man i'm gonna see snow get (laughs) get to play soccer and everything so yeah so like that's how my parents selected me and i wish i had every detail to tell you because i i even don't because I need, I need to get that. I need to talk to my parents about that. But yeah, so that's how it started. And we, but the process, man, it was a long time. I think it took almost a year and a half or a year or a year and a half. Yeah. And it, it was crazy, man. The court, I mean, they came, I think, three times before. Like the third time was the final time they took us. But they t- came two at a time, one full court. The first one to visit us. Um. The second one is like for court to get it finalized and make sure my mom or and Reggie's mom or parents didn't really want to back out from it. And the third time was the final time they uh, brought us here. You know, it was an exciting time. Mm. Yeah, it, it was. It's crazy, man. It's uh, it was again. It was a roller coaster of uh, process and life that I lived but as soon as we uh my parents selected me we went to Addis Ababa was the capital of Ethiopia and we stayed in this transition house they called it and this is kids who are selected to get adopted just waiting for the court or their paperwork to go through to get approved by the government and uh me and Reggie finally met for the first time there uh, my parents sent me this picture. I actually have a picture of me holding the like the little scrapbook they sent us. All the family members, Molly, Maddie, uh, Allie, and then my parents and my grandma Sue. Like and my, it, it was all in there. And I had my hand over Reggie one hand, and I had the bib, and we were like doing that little crazy Ethiopian smile, you know. So the teeth. <laughs> So the teeth, <laughs> but that was the first time like I felt like, yep, it's hundred percent that I am going to America, you know, and it, again, like I said, reality really set in. When we first met him, it was in this alley, right? It was in this alley. It was me and this guy. I was wearing this green shirt with white stripes and nicest clothes I can find, man. It was. I want to look dapper for my family, for my my new family, and Allie was the first one that came with, uh, with my family to see us, because she was the oldest. I think they did by age, and they came out of this van, and we were, it was like 
a dirt road. It was like buildings, I guess, being built or something. And they pulled in a van and me and this guy were just waiting for him, like to get in the van and stuff. And I remember giving my mom, which she had put like puffy hair, you know, like shortcut hair with for whatever hair product that she'd be putting on that time. And I hugged her. I like, I remember saying, I love you, mom. Like that's like in my broken English. That's the first thing I said. I love you, mom. I didn't even care who she was. I didn't even care what her story was. I know I saw a picture of her. And then Alex was bawling, I remember. And yeah, and then we got in the van. It literally like, I just met my family, got in the van, and that was what it looked like. You know, you, you just, you saw a picture, you meet them, you got in the, in the van. Like, at least for me, I don't know what the process looked like for the everybody else that got adopted, but yeah. And I just, at that moment, I felt like I was at home. I was, I found a family that wanted me and like, it was oh, honestly one of the best feelings at the same time and the scariest feeling. Because like I told you, fringes were like huge, which Americans, we call them fringes, but they were huge. And like, I saw like there was candy in the car, man. I was chowing down some caramel, like it was going out of style. And, <laughs> but yeah, we went to the transition house, I think, guest house, I think we stayed at while they were there. And then we went to the transition house after they left while the paperwork and then they came back a second time they brought maddie and my aunt laura man i want to say grandma sue came but i'm not sure i don't i'm not 100 percent. i think she might have and that was when my mom came to the court um which was hard for me because i i haven't seen her for what two years at that point I was in the orphanage. Maybe once in a while when I was in the orphanage at Walisa, where I was from, my first orphanage, she would come maybe once every blue moon. I, I can't even like put a number on it, a date on it. And then that was it. And she can't even come in. We would see through the gate or the wooden gate that stood there. And and then she was gone. Like That was, that was it. So when I first saw her, I... I kind of like, you know, hugged her and talked about it because that was, she was given every right to my parents at that time. That was the second time that my parents came visit me. And I was, that was it. So, um, it was, a, uh, it was like, it was definitely hard. We didn't know what she was going to say. And my parents were like kind of telling me now that I, I was here, like we, they were scared, you know, like, because they could back out. They could say, no, no, I don't want to do that. But my mom didn't, you know, like she went through with it and yeah. And the third, that was finalized. The court was kind of done with it. It was a long, tedious process that needed to happen. But a um, lot of prayers from here, a lot of prayers, people saying, you know, donation. I mean, when I came here, when I actually understood the process that went into it and the people that lend the help it was honestly overwhelming because look a kid two kids from ethiopia who are thousands and thousands of miles away who they, they didn't even know who we were other than our name and our probably picture you know but <laughs> that was that kind of like kind of environment that I was going to be brought into a, a Christian faith strong my dad was very strong in his faith my mom was too my my whole family was my whole family was and yeah I, God had a path for me and he really came through and even at a young age where I didn't even know who God was but he had a path that I knew he knew what he wanted exactly me to be but yeah, yeah, that was yeah. what the process looked like and kind of meeting my family for the first time in that little alley. Um, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's that dude. That is like a beautiful, first off, a beautiful story, but like an exact representation of what Jesus has done for us. Oh, absolutely, like, man. 
man, like he, like the fact, like the fact that she was scrolling through, man, and she saw that smile, like, <laughs> yeah, that was no accident. Coincidences like that, they, they don't happen unless the Holy Spirit is working. That's, that's crazy, man. Well, there's millions and millions of kids out there that need it. And my picture, my God put in her heart to just keep scrolling through my picture. And that itself is crazy, you know? Yeah, no, man. It's, it's crazy. That, that's yeah. really the word I can say about it. It's just crazy. Because you can't really find a word for it. Yeah. What? What, what was it like being a, a pastor's kid? Like coming from Ethiopia to straight into uh, a believing home. I don't know if you had any religious beliefs in Ethiopia or what that was like. But like, yeah, to talk about the drastic difference and the change of daily pace. Yeah. So like I told you earlier, you know, like um, the environment that I was in was a Christian family. Like when the support and the love that I felt while getting going through the process and my family was getting even for two kids that never knew. It kind of showed the faith, the strong faith that I was going to go into a family household I was going to go into. But being in Ethiopia, I never really had no faith or believed in God. I think Catholic was one of the biggest um, religion back in Ethiopia. Um, but I never really was. I, I lived to survive. I stole from I went like, do we have these marketplaces, right? Where people are sitting and selling kind of like spices, fruits, like you name it. We like it's, and I would go there with pickpocket people, steal from people because, or bread, oh bread, man. If you got bread, man, you're golden. Bread was huge back in Ethiopia, man. And you see bread shops everywhere, everywhere you go. But, yeah, so when I came here, it was something I had to learn. And actually, I forgot to tell you, man, like, when we walked in, so I, first we had a, a Drango, Dodge Drango, my parents drove from the airport. We went to this our house, right? It, this is, I think, the best part of my, like, what my parents told me recently, not too long ago, about what. I said to him that really stuck with them and really made them cry. It was like, when we walk into, the, we we lived in Auburn, Indiana when I first got adopted. We were driving in Dodge Ringo, which I thought it was the craziest thing. They had the TV that pulled down and like you can put CD in there and you can watch movies. I don't know what it was saying, but I knew I could see the cartoon. So I it was awesome. And they, we pulled in to this garage, right? It's two door garage, two car garage. And there was an attic and there were stairs that would lead up to it. And when we pulled in, I was just like shocked. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is our house. What? Do we sleep up there? I was this is the Ethiopian nine year old Jacob. Like, do we sleep up there? Like, is that is that where we're gonna like I was I never seen a house that big, first of all. And it was the garage. It wasn't a house, it was a garage. And I thought the attic was what they lived. And they started crying and said, no, that's not who we live. And we, walked, we walked out of the garage, went to the door. And now if you think I thought the garage was our home, imagine what I thought when I saw the home. Like never had no living room, no stairs, let alone I lived in this house that I built. I helped build the house in Ethiopia by stumping in the mud and sticking it to the like, I remember the whole process. And then I walked upstairs. I have my own bed, like my own bed with like, there's, it was, I think Reggie was with me too. He had his own bed. I had my own because in the transition house, me and Reggie slept together. I don't know how long we were there for, like it was six months, five months. And we always slept together. I kind of like take care of Reggie. And when I saw my bed, man, I, that was it. I, I was, I never had a bed. I slept with 10 people when I lived with my grandma. My grandma is a big old lady in Ethiopia, man. Let me tell you. So she took up most of the space. It was it was a room about 10 by 10, even. You know, so she took up most of the bed. So you're sweating. You, it, it, was, it was a sight. It was a lot of kids sleeping in one bed, long bed. And 
having my own bed was crazy. So yeah, and we would go to church every Sunday. Um, Lakewood Park was my where my dad was a superintendent at, and just the environment I came to was the Christian faith. You know, like yeah, it wasn't yeah. really anything really to discuss or anything. I I just truly just sunk myself into it because that was what my family believed in, and. Going to Sunday, doing Wana's, uh, youth groups. It, it was just easy to have a person to look, to look at, who gave you all my life. That who gave me the life that I had at a, such a young age, even though I was nine, and knew everything that was going on, and battled with so many thoughts and whys, you know, a lot of whys. Um, but the one thing I did was, I wasn't really good with the emotional opening up like i told you earlier physical physical pain i can take all day you hit me with a brick i i'll bounce back up and say it won't hurt but that emotional opening up actually saying yeah i did get hit to soccer today and my leg hurts saying that mm. but <laughs> the pain i don't care it does i i will hide it because you can't show no fear in ethiopia you can't show no pain but it was one of those things that you grew up learning. But here they instilled in us, it's okay to say that you're hurt. It's okay to say I need help. And that's the one thing I struggled with because I'm I, I such a young age I became a self dependent. Providing for myself, not really looking for any anybody's help. Mm. I struggled with that. <clears throat> I would when we get in an argument, I was a very stubborn kid growing up. We had a lot of arguments, me, where I thought I knew it all with my parents. But there was that part of them trying to get me to open up. Say, Jake, I'm wrong. I understand. You know, my I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry, Dad. Like, that was really the toughest <laughs> part. And I would run away when we get in fights. Because that was my first thing, is just run. So I struggled with that for a long time. Um, and it literally recently, not too long, a year or two, three years ago where I kind of started getting into okay talk open up you know it's not good to just hide your feelings and not let it blow up but that's that's just you know the kind of mindset I had because of the past that I was I went through you know and so but again growing up in a Christian household being a pastor kid made me thrive Put me through a lot of challenges, but made me to the man I am through mistakes, through heartbreaks, tears, but eventually getting to know God and putting my faith in. And I, and it was in that room, my first bedroom that I had my dad knelt down and he said, do you want to give your life to God? And I, I, I remember, I think I was crying and I said, yeah. I didn't understand what it meant. I didn't understand what I had to do from their point on. But I knew somebody was looking out for me. I knew there was somebody watching after him because, again, he brought me out of nowhere. <laughs> you know, picture on the website my mom kept going over and over was what God put in my mom's heart. At that point, I didn't need no convincing who God was, even though I, I questioned him every day. Because again, the why is so much like circle in my mind, but it was one of those things that just naturally came to me because my family was strong believer in God. We went to church every Sunday, so it was it was an easy process. It, it was not one bit hard. I think as I grew up, it kind of it kind of got tougher and tougher, and the more of the battles, the past kept creeping up on me. Um, really tested my faith, but other than that, being Growing up in a Christian household was something that just happened. It was quite. It wasn't questioned by me. It wasn't really a a battle that needed to happen for me to give my life to God. It just happened. Yeah, so, yeah. That's so cool, man. What um, what was it like being in like you were homeschooled, right? Weren't you? Or, so, no, or, we or, 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 or what did you? Park, okay. Yeah, Parkview. I, okay. Not oh, Parkview. you Parkview. Oh, Lakewood you Parkview. Park. Okay. Lakewood, I did, but I went to Lakewood Park first. My dad was a superintendent. But I, um, 
went there. I started my third grade year. So I, I was so behind in school, you know, and it was a private school. My dad was a uh, superintendent at, and it was like the end of third grade year where I started. And it was with my sister, Maddie, who's my twin. And well, she's not really my, she's a giant. She's six one. So she, she can't really, you know, but anyways, it was third grade and I didn't know anything. I barely knew how to speak English, but I lost my language super fast. How to speak mm. Amharic? Super fast. I, I don't know what it was. Maybe I was way too much into we, you know, we sports. Oh man, that's every day after school. No homework <laughs> was getting done as soon as you get home. No way. <laughs> no. So, but yeah, it was like one of those things. I lost it super fast and I was good at math. I picked up math um, and soccer. It, it, soccer was was in my DNA. It was something I did every day in Ethiopia. Even when I didn't go to school in the orphanage, I would juggle. I would play by myself. And so when I came here, and we never really saw grass. You know, when we played, if there was grass, it was probably super dry because again, it's Ethiopia. We're close to the equator, and you, you're playing in a quote unquote not a desert, but like a dry land. Right? We got two goals. With, from Iraq, you wear no shoes. If you have busted shoes, hey, you're golden, man. That's like Nike, Nike, uh, Ronaldo shoes. Like the, you, you were golden. Hey, you, you, that was the kid that you want on your team if you had shoes on, because you know he's gonna be running fast. He's gonna be scoring the goals. But yeah, no, it's like when we came here, I joined my first team. I forgot the name of it. I was nine. I was 10. I was nine. And I remember there's a picture my mom took on the grass field with my first soccer shoes and this orange jersey holding my soccer ball on my side on my hip with my little bag. I, I thought I was in heaven, man. Like, it was like for a kid growing up playing soccer, comes to a, America, he's going to school has his own bed and he's playing a sport that he just played every day but in an organized way and i'm telling you man i was i was beyond blessed when that happened you know when i first joined that soccer team i was blessed be before that but i was just like it was soccer was something i knew and really connected with where i i put all my trouble in thought into because it was something that never really talked back just really took the hits from me you know just pounds the soccer ball and it was the soccer ball we made out of scrap it was we go around collect uh we collect a plastic bags and then sometimes like we find clothes that have been cut up we sew it we sew that bad boy and it bounced nice like a soccer ball it bounced it was it was not you could juggle it you can it was beautiful like it was self-made so yeah yeah but yeah no it was uh interesting the first school like i went to my dad being a principal and i struggled a lot you know catching up to my grade but i was like i said i was good at math reading i struggled with reading a oh, man i didn't put the work into it i mean i can't really lie but it was one of the things that like just didn't come easy to me and but Math was the thing that I fell in love with, and I was good at with numbers. So, yeah. yeah. So, what do you what do you do now then with all the different busyness of like? I know do you work literally like I swear you work eight days a week, man. Like, what do you <laughs> to, to tell the people what you do, man? Oh, uh, so I am in inside sales. I graduated in a crazy time again, it, COVID in the heart of COVID, where we did the like four months. Um, from home online so i worked at cedarhurst and i made a connection with the director there and her husband say uh, he was a sales coach he just got the job not too long ago uh before she told me that the job was open a sales inside sales job was open um and he told me hey i'll teach you everything you need to know about sales and i i have i have a knack for people i like i was at the assisted living place for almost two years yeah it had to be close to two years and then i did a i was a cna 
they gave us room during the pandemic. I never did school. Mr. Still, I'm sorry if you listen to this or if you will listen to this, but I, I never did school. Like I, they gave us room there where we would literally sleep there. Me, Dylan, and Maddie wake up, go in the kitchen and from the kitchen. But we weren't doing that because we had to. We were doing that because we wanted to. Everybody was super scared and there was nobody to help the people. And I fell in love with the people. The elderly tell so many stories. But through that, through Cedarhurst, where it was where I made the connection with AJ and got me the sales job in Auden Schaumburg, uh, a company called Genuine Cable Group. So for the past four and a half months, I've been there uh, just training. But now we're actually started doing business. So yeah, but now that and then I work at Grace Coffee and Wine and Eat. It's it's absolutely like I that's where I go to work and that's how we met. Well, I, I we saw each other at Sandwich Fair, but we sat there and talked for yeah. a long time. I what was it two and a half hours, two hours? I don't even know how yeah. long it was. Yeah. We made a great connection there. But yeah, so I work there on weekends, Saturday and Sundays. Um but yeah, I'm blessed. I am blessed beyond measure. But like I love grinding. I love working seven days a week and I put on myself to do that because it's just who I am. I love providing for myself. Um, but yeah, so that's that's what I do in uh then short words, I guess. Yeah. Well thank you, Jacob, so much for sharing, dude. All the the back history of the amount of things you went through, dude. You gotta write a book. You you have to write a book, man. The amount of things the, like I mean, this was only like what a half an hour, forty five minutes, and there were so many avenues we could have gone down. I know we're short on time, but Dude, seriously, write a book or even just sit down, set up your camera, man, and just talk for an hour or two because there's so many parallels. I mean, it, that's an incredible testimony, first off, but there's there's so many things to talk about there. Um, your story is incredible, man, and it's 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 inspiring, man. That's, that's incredible. The work of the Holy Spirit guiding your mom to be able to pick you out, right, in a crowd of hundreds of kids, thousands of kids, like... That's incredible, man. Yeah, man, it is. It is crazy. But again, I'm blessed. And my faith it has been tested in the past few years. But I know where it lies. I know where my heart lies. And it's always been with God. And he's through so many times that I've let him go saying, it was your fault. It was you. When everything I do something wrong, I point my finger and run away from God. And I have so many times and he keeps pulling me in. He keeps pulling me in by lessons. He teaches me through things that I would go through, you know, and like that's a lesson that God is teaching me to, hey, I'm still here. I'm still your father. I put you out of the dump of yeah. Ethiopia and you're and doesn't mean you're going to stop struggling. Doesn't mean you're not going to have hardship here, but it is a a life lesson I want you to learn as my child every day. And again, I told you, I've been running away from God for so long. And and I have family members, people that support me, Kyle, Dylan, uh, Sammy Swenson, my dad, my dad, man. My dad is my rock. I, I don't tell him that quite often. I don't, we really butt heads a lot about just different things, but He's he's uh he's my role model. My dad is my role model. And if I could be like him, the patient he has, the love and the heart my parents, have, even my mom, they have for people, for adoption, for foster care. It's crazy. Um they have this nonprofit organization. We just fostered four new girls uh, not too long ago in Jose. Um I am one of 10. And just the love and the heart they have for kids, it's beyond words. I can't even really bring it to words, but it is shows over and over. And this nonprofit organization they started, I don't know how they do it. I don't know what goes into their mind because that's a lot of work, man. But they do it. They love it. They are literally today. I'm at their house right now, and they're delivering uh, goodie bags to people that just got fostering kids so whenever they come in when they have kids that come into their house 
that they're fostering call to care will go to their house and bring them this uh you got a bag of goodies like just for the first few nights and then we help them through it we connect with them so that's what happens so but yeah they run that but again luke i i really do thank you for giving me the opportunity to give me the platform to uh speak and talk about my life it's been a it's been really awesome getting to know you and the person you are and this platform that you have to really bless a lot of people and it's neat to see and i am grateful that we got to meet in grace god works in mysterious ways but i really do appreciate it man yeah if people wanted to follow you where should we send them yeah so i uh i have an instagram uh uh, it's Jacoby, J-A-C-O-B with I-E in the end, and then underscore Chapman. Um, you can follow me there. And I really encourage you, if you guys want to follow something, really follow my parents' call to care. We are called to care. Um, it's a ministry. It's a nonprofit ministry. Is and it and it's all for Is it called to care.com? Is that what it is? We are called to care. You can follow them on Instagram um, if you want. And then... Yeah, it's they're doing a lot of things coming up in March that is all going to foster associations in Illinois to help out. We have a, an NFL player, I think, coming to speak to it. Can buy us a dinner at Whitetail Ridge. I don't know if you guys know where that is. But if you need information, yeah, just link with me on um Instagram and I can give you information. But it's a it's a it's a really good Thing to give back to kids in our own backyards not not just in the foreign countries not just in third world countries there's kids around us that need help and if you're looking if you have a heart for kids and want to help out in some way even prayer no, you don't you don't have to give anything just prayer that kids find what they're looking for because right in your backyard there's a, a kid that is looking for a mentorship somebody to give them just a hug you know, so I, I encourage you guys to just, you know, just go check it out and see what my parents' nonprofit program is all about and just pray. That's it. Just pray. If you can't do anything else, just pray for us. But I appreciate that. Thanks for coming on to the show. What's happening, people? Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And consider subscribing. Peace.